Might as well. Can you all hear me at the back there? Excellent. So we're going to have a great hour session where we're going to really get to grips with um, probably the biggest impact on our industry in the last 20 years, which has been the emergence of technologies like intelligent automation and digital. Uh, my name is Phil First. I'm the CEO founder of HFS, as introduced. Uh, we're a company which really gets excited about an emerging industry beyond where we've come from, and we call it digital operations. It's where we see um, a whole um, conglomerate of people who've come from software, from robotic process automation, from AI, from global sourcing and talent, from blockchain, as we were just hearing about, and digital business models. And we see this emerging industry as digital operations. And I think Central Eastern Europe has an amazing opportunity to really spearhead this because the t you've got the talent, the multilingual capability, and you've got some great emerging companies which are really starting to perform. Because when you look at Silicon Valley today, you know, 10 years ago, you'd need 5 million a year run rate to run a startup. Now it's 100 million a year. So investors are looking more at regions like CEE and China, for example, as places to invest. And just some examples, you know, Estonia has become a real hotbed um, in recent years in blockchain. Uh, it started in 2008. Um, Skype um, and TransferWise are online money transfer startups which came out of Estonia. Um, the Central Bank of Lithuania has launched a new regulatory sandbox for startups working with blockchain as well. Uh, Czech Republic and, and Slovenia uh, they spend just as much on research innovation as Western um, countries do, and Slovakia's investments have been rocketing four times ahead of the EU average. Antivirus softwares have become um, prevalent as well. Czech Republic's Avast, AFG, and Slovakia's Asset um, are well known now in the cybersecurity market. Hungary's Prezi is a really cool online presentation app which has really taken the corporate world by storm. It's used by millions. And not to forget Romania's UiPath, which is one of the darlings of RPA, which is uh, now one of the most uh, sought-after unicorns in the industry. Uh, their CEO has moved from Bucharest to New York recently, uh, and they're really going great, gangs in their, great guns in their business. Also some interesting data. Um, Central Eastern Europe actually boasts 17% of initial coin offerings uh, conducted globally. Um, 130 come out of Russia and that country is by far the regional leader, but also Estonia and Slovenia and Ukraine have uh, been very prevalent and active in these initial coin offerings. So what do I love about Poland? It's a lovely country. It's first, my first visit to Poznan, and I was amazed at how beautiful and how colorful this city is. Um, and I've made sure we've really learned about <laughs> A lot of things going on. 400,000 graduates from institutions of higher education each year, half of them from engineering. Warsaw has got a culture that's um, acting like a magnet now for many startups and innovators. Poznan is one of the major trade centers in Poland. You know, direct flights coming out to many different countries now for trade. Uh, Krakow, Katowice, and Lodz, um, the best BPO and international shared services cities in the world. Everyone talks about them with pride. I was just with Infosys the other day who said, you have to visit Wodge. We're, so, you know, we're getting some of our best multilingual delivery coming from there. I've personally been to Krakow a couple of times, and I, I love the city, and I'm going back in a couple of weeks. Um, you know, we've seen the messaging app 5 that was built by a bunch of Polish college kids, which has created messaging accessible to deaf users worldwide. Confirm is a blockchain anti-money laundering risk and compliance platform that's really getting great guns. Other companies worth talking about is Estimote in IoT. Growbots, as you probably are all familiar with, a great outbound sales automation tool that's um, getting a lot of funding now, and it's moved its headquarters to San Francisco. Uh, Brainly is a group of social learning networks for students and educators, and I'll talk about Ivona, which is very exciting. It's now become um, the uh, voice-to-speech explore by touch application that's being used by Amazon, and it's replacing Amazon Polly. Uh, Nethone has been an AI um, solution for fraud protection, and DeepSense.ai is also getting a lot of impact in the industry. So some really interesting things coming out of this country, and I wanted to make it sure that you know, we are covering this as an analyst firm. We're very excited about what is happening here, and that's the reasons why we want to come and be part of this conversation with you. 
But today, I really want to talk about this unification of digital business models, intelligent automation, analytics, and creative talent that's happening right before our very eyes. Um, here's some data from our state of industry study we conduct every year with KPMG on the global 2,380 decision makers. And we ask them, what pressure is coming from your C-suite uh, to drive your operation strategy? And unsurprisingly, cost is always the biggest pressure. You know, 90% of organizations still have that cost pressure. But in terms of what's happening just behind the cost is this desire to invest in uh, process automation. It's this desire to create real-time data that supports predictive decisions. And it's aligning the middle to back office to, to really improve customer experiences. And something else worth mentioning as well, 49% of, of companies are getting increasing importance in investing in, in innovative cognitive technologies. So a shift's happening. Maybe 10, 20 years ago, companies were looking at saying, let's just look at offshoring and outsourcing to drive out cost. Now they're looking at how do we broaden that into really fixing our data underbelly to improve our automation and our capabilities there. And I'll carry on with this piece of information um, coming from our intelligent operations study where a quarter, close to a quarter of organizations today have more than half their data structured. You can't even think about doing RPA success successfully or even think about getting into blockchain, as examples, until you've actually fixed your underbelly of data. And this is what is happening with so many organizations today. They moved into, they moved into many of these engagements. A lot of companies have done these pilot studies. They've spent millions and millions of dollars on this and realized this is just the start of a journey where we're finally not just thinking about our people and our talent, but how do we enable them with better technology, better data, better automation? In terms of digital disruption, digital is about the ability to respond to the needs of your customers as and when they occur. And when we did a study of 395 chief digital officers this year, we asked them if they had the same top two competitors as they had now as in 2014. And you can see here that 29% uh, have already seen their top two competitors change because of digital disruption just in the last two or three years. And that number is increasing to 37% in the next couple. So you think about the, the, the way that the makeup of our industries are changing, the types of organizations that are coming into play, we have to look at two dimensions here. How do we augment our traditional business models with digital technology, and how do we cope with the emergence of disruptive models which can completely change the fabric of an industry. So we look at something we call the digital one office framework. And here you will recognize the front office of an organization. This is, we used to call this the omni-channel many years ago, but this is how you communicate in real time with your customers, you know, using mobile, social, interactive technologies with touch interaction, how you design your customer processes. But none of this will work if you don't have an empowering digital one office to make it happen. You need to start thinking about wrapping your processes around the needs of your customers so you can be able to respond to their needs when they happen. So you have what we call a digital underbelly. This is where we digitize and automate processes. This is where we look at security, cloudification of data, the unification of data. And then we start to think about the human element of all this. So we look at intelligent support functions, where, for example, a siloed finance organization may look at order the cash. Now they may need to start to think about customer cash. How can they broaden processes? How can they leverage technologies? How can they become more autonomous as organizations to be able to respond to the needs of their customers as and when they happen? And then finally, we have what we term as like the neural network of the organization, which is when we get into predictive digital insights. This is where we start to think about getting away from archives of historical data and information and thinking about making decisions that are predictive based on the information we need. So how can we think about more intelligent types of cognitive solutions and machine learning to make that happen for us? It's about collaboration. It's about being dynamic. It's about being responsive. It's about being simple. But the bottom line is, is we don't believe there'll be this delineation between front, middle, and back office in the future. It's going to be one office. Because I think the biggest issue impacting our industry in the last 20 years has been its obsession with incremental benefits. So companies would do outsourcing because they could shave 10% here, 20% there. 
they didn't have an end game in mind. It was just how do we keep squeezing more costs out of the system? How can we keep getting prices down? That attitude has to shift to let's design an end framework that we can work towards that's going to actually make us operate as one office and not a siloed bunch of functions that are not particularly well integrated, where finance is doing this, they're not really talking to procurement, who's not really talking to HR. This has to come together as one integrated end framework. And we're starting to see some really interesting examples of one office from some of the pioneers of industry, like Procter & Gamble, as an example. So how do we get there with one office? It's not just a fancy UI. It's about getting your business operations integrated front to back. Cost reduction is not your strategy. Drive metrics that measure value creation. Stop kicking this intelligent technology can down the road. It's all here now, and you need to make decisions uh, where you go with it. You have to weed out people unprepared to change. And I, I was chatting earlier with my team, and I actually asked some millennials in my company, and I look forward to hearing from Simon Sinek, because he's a specialist on millennials. But I said to them, why are you people different from us mid-career folks? And the answer was very simple. They said, we share. We share our information. It's cool to share and learn. You know? And I realize you can go on LinkedIn now and learn everything you need to know about products and services and, and different types of technologies because these people are sharing information. Us middle, middle career people, late career people, we still think knowledge is power. We hoard it all. So sharing is so important. And if people won't share, they won't get into the spirit of change within your organization, embracing new technologies then you may need to weed them out. It's as simple as that. Build more co-innovation partnerships. Those relationships and partnerships that got you here might not be the ones to take you where you're going. They, they may have been great at supporting legacy processes and legacy ways of doing things, but as you look out into the future, do you really have what you need? And my argument is stop thinking about the future of work. It's already here. Anyone talk to me about the future of work, I'm going to get pretty upset, because it's actually here, it's now. The technology here, the technology is now. I've just come back from a large number of meetings with companies using AI tools, automation tools, and they're only using 10, 20, 30% of the functionality. The key now is how do we embrace this and how do we work with this effectively? So just to give you some stories of, I think, disruption and innovation, and we'll take these into our panels as well, one lovely company we all know well is Xerox. Um, this, at one point, had more patents than IBM. This was one of the darlings of corporate America. It was an innovative company. It was all about you know, leveraging great thinking and great ideas and great people. And this company was recently acquired by, I think, Fujifilm in Japan for about $18 billion. So this is a pretty sad end to an amazing business. Um, because they just couldn't change the model. They could only do one thing one way, and they couldn't evolve into other models to keep them successful, and eventually they got smaller and now got acquired. Here's another company. Uh, has anyone heard of Zuma Pizza? Nobody. You probably wouldn't, because it's based in California. But this company decided to start making pizzas with robots. So they would use the pizzas to knead the dough, put the toppings on the pizzas, and then move them into these delivery trucks where you could fit 200 pizzas at a time into these ovens. So these pizzas would cook as they were being delivered to your house. And eventually, uh, you'd get this lovely hot pizza delivered. Did you really care that that was cooked for you by a robot? Maybe not. <laughs> um, but it was very clever because what they started to do at Zoomer was rather than hire lots of people just to make the pizzas, knead the dough, put on the sauce, put on the toppings, they actually hired data scientists and marketing people so they could actually design specific pizzas for the finale of Game of Thrones or the Super Bowl or the, or the, or the uh, you know, European Cup final, that sort of thing. So they, these types of models can completely change the fabric of an industry. Another company in the insurance sector uh, I've been fascinated with is called Lemonade as an example, and they've completely flipped the traditional insurance model on its head. They took the attitude, when you give your money to an insurance company for a home or a rental or something, that's not their money, that's your money. And so what they did was they said, you pay us a flat fee once a year, nominate a charity or a philanthropy of your choice, and at the end of the year, for any unclaimed claims, we will pay that money to that charity of the choice. So they felt that they were getting away from insurance fraud because they were building the goodwill and the impact of their clients. In addition to that, 
It's a completely API apps-driven company. They use a bot called Maya to actually do the policies for you. Um, and they leverage behavioral scientists and AI to be really effective at what they do. But this has been massively disruptive, and they've been taking clients from all these traditional insurance carriers over the last couple of years, and they've had a $120 million injection from SoftBank. So this is completely flipping around how insurance is going to be done in, in many different markets. But it's also about traditional markets as well. Um, just some examples here on how AI was leveraged. So Zurich Insurance deployed AI, and their chairman recently came out and said they'd cut processing time from an hour to just seconds uh, by saving 40,000 work hours and speeding up claims processing time to five seconds. Uh, there's a retailer called Staples in the US, which has this lovely thing called an easy button, which you press. So what they've done is they've given this easy button to office managers within their locations. So when they want to order something, they press the easy button and order their stationery. They talk into the device and they've linked it via a Watson API so they can get the order done. So simple things like that are augmenting businesses as well. But just remember, it's not just about technology. Technology is the enabler for the business. The real goal with digital is about uh, impacting the customer experience. You know, Netflix didn't kill Blockbuster. Ridiculous late fees killed Blockbuster. Amazon isn't killing other retailers. It's bad customer service and bad experience, which is killing other retailers. Airbnb isn't killing the hotel industry. It's not having availability and pricing options that we want. So it's not just about technology. Technology is the baseline. The real business model is around impacting the customer experience with innovative new ways of doing things. So let's quickly go towards the impact of outsourcing and technology. Uh, this is a study we ran of 100 C-suite executives, and we divided this question into the business people. And we asked them, what is preventing you getting to a digital one office framework? And what you can see here is legacy thinking, legacy mindset. That's what's holding them back. People who are not being inclusive, are not sharing, who are not being autonomous with the way they're doing things. Um, so they think it's a shift in the mindset which is their biggest issue. But let's get to the IT people. They agree legacy thinking is holding them back both from the business side and the IT side, but overwhelmingly, 45% of the IT C-suite are coming out and saying a lack of talent is what is holding them back. So it's not just about the mindset, it's a lot about the technology, and this creates a great opportunity for service providers and third parties and emerging nations to fill those gaps, learning about Python and R and blockchain and some of these emerging techs which are gonna take us forward. And just to sort of really hit home how this industry has shifted, we've taken our state of industry study from 2014 in the blue, 2016 in the orange, 2018 in the green, and we've asked the leaders of Global 2000 organizations their intended investments in offshore, nearshore. And you can just see each year the, uh, invent the intentions are getting less and less and less. You know, Three years ago, 22% of the Global 2000 were going to increase investments in FNA, offshore, nearshore. Now it's nothing. They just want to keep it level. Customer service is down to 5%. IT is down to 5%. So buyers aren't thinking anymore about, we move, about moving work around the world. They're thinking about how do they get things done? Because outsourcing is increasing. So outsourcing is increasing, but they're not thinking about where they're actually locating the business anymore. You know, and you can see here that industries like software and high tech, energy utilities, they're looking to increase their outsourcing, whereas banking and, and, and insurance are actually pulling back a little bit. Also, it's about partnerships. It's not about outsourcing anymore. When we spoke to these decision makers around digital, we asked them to talk about their best relationships with their service providers. How would you describe that? And with the orange color here, are those highest quartile of performers in terms of revenue um, and growth, and 57% see their partner, their service partner, as somebody who proactively innovates and invests with them to find new thresholds of value to achieve co-defined business outcomes. It's not just about these fairly turgid, we buy, you provide relationships anymore. This is about partnerships. This is the future. And as we get into um, investments in cost reduction, you can see here um, RPA, was far and away the number one choice for 53% of the Global 2000 as a cost reduction tool coming into this year above the cloud and IoT. So there's this focus now towards 
this investment in automation. And as you can see here, we've taken all the industries and we've shown their increased focus in outsourcing and we've compared it with their increased focus in RPA. And you can see massive differences, particularly in mature industries, which have done a lot of offshore, a lot of nearshore, like insurance and BFS. They're all looking at RPA as the new way of balancing out their portfolio. So as much as we want to hide away from what is happening, we're in a humans plus bots world. It's about looking at how do we build out um, deals, contracts, relationships where we have robotics and people working side by side, making this thing more effective. So we you know, ask clients, you know, when you're hiring people, what sort of talent are you looking for? And up the top here, they're looking to find talent with right brain skills. They're looking for talent who have curiosity, entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial spirit, who can define business outcomes, who have a vision and ability to drive change. They're not looking so much for people who are good at improving processes, maybe even good at doing analytics. So clients are looking at the creativity side. They're not looking so much at the left brain side, which I think is a tremendous opportunity for the service provider community to provide that left brain to support the right brain of the clients. This is where they're investing. So to surmise, how do we survive as digital workers in this industry? It's about being smart about data. It's no longer geeky, it's career critical. It's about quick wins that can drive momentum. So take a project, take maybe an AI tool or a piece of machine learning and show how you delivered value in that one process. Sell that with your friends and your colleagues and then think of the next one, think of the next one. Really think about being a conduit of value and information within your organization and really include people, share things with people to get them energized and excited about what you're doing. So with that, I'd like to now move into our panel and invite, uh, invite the folks up to stage. Let me invite the panelists. Thank you it very is, much. Uh, Maciej Borkowski, Chief Risk Officer, uh, Poland Head Credit Suisse and Vice President of ABSL. Uh, Jolanta Gantkowska, Director of Operations Poland, Alexander Mann Solutions. Ivona Kozera, Partner, the Central and Southeast Europe Advisory Leader for EY and Katalin Miskolci, Senior Implementation Leader, uh, Corporate and Business Function Service Line Leader, McKinsey and Company, and our moderator. Okay. Yeah. First. Thank you. Fantastic. So I, got, I got two microphones. It's not going to be twice as loud. No. <laughs> Fantastic. Good. Um, so, uh, we're on. Brilliant. Um, so, can I have very quickly a 30 second introduction from everybody? Name, rank, serial number, maybe starting at the left. Katalin Mishkoitsi, McKinsey, Senior Implementation Leader and Expert in the Corporate and Business Functions Practice. Maciej Borkowski, Chief Risk Office Poland Head and Vice President Responsible for New Generation Services at ABSL. Jolanta Gantkowska, Director of Operations at Alexander Mann Solutions. Uh, Ivona Kozera, EY, uh, Central and uh, Eastern Europe Advisory Leader. Thank you very much. So without further ado, you know, let's start off with the bigger picture, maybe Catalin to start. You know, what's going to have the biggest impact on business operations in two years? Is it GDPR? Is it blockchain? Is it something else? You have an impressive list there. <laughs> and, uh, and when I looked at it first, I'm, I was thinking, what is really impact? The way you assess impact is quite different along these lines. So uh, maybe I will give one example where uh, McKinsey actually quantified the impact, and that would be automation. Uh, but before I go there, I don't want to discard any of the uh, really exciting topics there on the board we've heard before um, on the um, impact of blockchain in financial services. You can all imagine the risk-related impact of cybersecurity and all the revenue impact of the big data analytics. So there is a lot uh, outside of automation. But looking at the room here, most of us uh, have some uh, relationship to shared services, business services. So automation would be maybe one of the, the biggest um, items on our own list. Um, so the McKinsey Global Institute conducted the research last year um, 
on the global impact of automation. Um, um, and uh, with today's available technology, we estimated that you can actually take out $16 trillion worth of work hours that are currently spent in uh, activities that could be automated. And if you look at it in terms of workforce impact, that would be 1.1 billion full-time equivalents wow. that the technology, automation technology, will just take out globally. And roughly two-thirds of that are in uh, China and India alone. So in our region, if you're talking about centrists in Europe, we heard in the morning the numbers, for instance, in Poland, the, the hundreds of thousands of people who work in um, areas where, the, where there is still a significant amount of data processing, data collection types of works. And those two areas alone tend to be the, um, the top automatable uh, areas after predictable physical activities. So in these two areas, very relevant for shared services, you have well over 60% automation potential. Thank you. If I may add, uh the short answer is automation, my opinion, definitely, but there are two caveats to it. Um, the first one being that, to me, automation is just part of a larger journey which will be driven by um, uh, AI in the future. So just a puzzle piece, a very important one, the most important for the next two years, but still just one of the um, uh, pieces within uh, AI. And the second one is, if you ask us the same question with the same slide, well, roughly the same slide five years ago, uh, the list would have been a little shorter. Uh, some of the technologies or events have not occurred uh, or were not uh, business ready by then. But the problem is that five years ago, I would have also answered automation, which brings us to the problem which, well, Wojtek alluded to it in the morning and you showed on some of your slides, Phil. Uh, we are terribly slow at implementing the automation. Yeah. So I think this is one of the mind shifts which we need to really apply going forward to simply speed up because we can't be focusing on the same biggest impact item for five years. Yeah. And to build on uh, what we just heard and also what we heard in the first part of the day, I think I would, I actually would pick um, AI and machine learning, but also that links to automation. But I think uh, the challenge is that I think if we look at the two years perspective, we will be making, making the mistakes. And that's why I think it's going to be a big impact on us because that's going to carry a lot of risk and potentially as us businesses running and, and at the same time piloting and testing, we've got to be patient. We heard that before, we've got to be patient of how we um, embrace it and how we still continue to run businesses and still uh, you know, make money. So I think for me, those two elements uh, in the next two years are going to be really, really impactful uh, and are going to test our ability to, uh, you know, to learn uh, from, uh, from, from failing potentially. Just to comment on the 60% pool of potentially you know, uh, being automated, I just want to say that coming from the pe people b business, we will probably, most of us uh, will agree that we are over hiring for some of the jobs that we have brought to Poland. So I do also see it as an opportunity to leverage the talent that we are hiring to do some of those tactical jobs that we are automating and therefore bring more and build more. Good stuff. I think let's, let's start moving on to the future of outsourcing, and maybe, maybe you can comment here, is do you see outsourcing generally becoming this mix of robots and humans? Well, uh, y y yes. I think we are not fully yet there in terms right. of specifically if we are talking about the big global giants of outsourcing, right? But I truly believe that uh, the speed of change is very rapid. And also to your point uh, that you described at the beginning, I think that in reality, this change is happening now, that uh, we should not wait we should not wait for the change happening to us. We should be making this change, right? And let me just uh, give you an example which is partially related to the questions that uh, was uh, answered already in terms of automation, artificial intelligence, but it also shows how this is changing on a daily basis. We, we, we've heard the macro assessment, but let me just give you an example that also relates to, to this question that you ask me now. Um, the, I truly believe that actually we are already at the stage that we apply together automation and artificial intelligence together. And actually the mix of those two 
gives the best results. And just as a very small example, um, we are currently working in implementation of the, with the technology uh, partner invoice sharing. Uh, the accounts payable change that uh, applies both artificial intelligence because this technology is reading unstructured data, observe trends and apply them, link them with the structured data. And based on that, uh, the automation uh, is applied based on certain rules. And purely by that application together, AI and automation, we are able to actually reduce the time of, uh, uh, of accounting for, of dealing with accounts payable uh, by one FTE, um, bringing this down to hundreds more effective time of dealing by one FTE with a payable. Yeah, so the change is huge, uh, and is happening already now. Interesting, and I think that brings us to this culture issue about how much is culture and change and mindset holding back companies from making these shifts? Maybe, Kathleen, you could from your experience? Very much, actually. Yeah. Um, so some of the um, speed aspects that we heard uh, um, relate to internal uh, blockers related to culture. And there are three aspects that I would uh, highlight there. One is um, being very siloed. The second one would be being very risk averse. And the third one would be not having within the organization the capabilities that are required for the culture change. Okay. So just to elaborate a little bit on that, it, um, I think the risk aversion is pretty clear for digital to take, in, take place. You need investments, and you need to be able to take calculated risks to spend that money to, to go down the path. For the siloed organizations, I believe uh, most of the companies that, that we work for, like large major companies, uh, still face um, the problem of functions not talking to each other, or even if they talk to each other, the processes and the tools are not uh, conducive to a proper cross-functional um, um, interaction. And these functional um, silos actually are a blocker in terms of a successful um, digital transformations. And then the third one on, on, on capabilities, there was a good example a few years ago by Nordstrom that they combined the um, the capabilities or the, or the mindset even of, um, of, uh, of the leadership team in a way uh, they rotated their leaders. So they, they had the brick and mortar executive swap roles with the online business executive so that they have a more consistent uh, view and aspiration for digitization of the company. Good. So why can't we change faster? Does everything have to be a five-year program? Maybe, Jolanta? I, yeah, we always have five-year yeah. plans, don't we? But I think that does link to the earlier question in terms of the uh, magnitude of a change that we potentially are experiencing. And when I think about the organization being big or small organizations, you always have probably, I would, I would risk, I always divide everything into three, and I would risk divided them into three. So you've got those who know how to, who, who know the, that the moon is there and they know how to get to the moon. Uh, and they really want to get there, and usually they see a very, you know, a great uh, business opportunity there, uh, you know, to grow, to accelerate, to be competitive. Then you have the group of believers who want to be with them, but they don't, may not, they may not know yet how to get there. Uh, so, so it's easier to convince them. And then probably majority of the organization are not yet on that journey, and therefore, if you do it too fast, then absolutely, you're going to fail. You've got to bring people on the journey. So I think from that cultural and change management perspective, you know, I don't know if it's two-year plan, three-year plan, or five-year plan, depending how big organization is, but for, for us, for me, this is one of the key factors where, why potentially in the world of unknown, and I think you alluded to that, you know, there is a lot of things coming in that we don't know what the impact of them will be yet. It's, 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 it's really hard to accelerate. Uh, and that risk of, uh, of uh, that's risk, risk of us, um, uh, attitude as well, because we just don't know what we don't know. So all of those uh, combination, in my view, are slowing us down. Uh, but uh, but uh, but I think I think the cultural one for me is the key one. No. I would uh, I would echo that. I would say that actually the biggest challenge we are facing in this digital transformation um, journey is the culture 
is the culture of the organizations and the culture of the leadership. Uh, truly, I think that uh, if we overcome that, the journey would be much faster. And uh, from the perspective of leadership, I think what we need is we need, uh, if I may use the word digital leader and digital leadership, which is very agile, which is very inclusive. And interestingly enough, if you read the research on the types and stereotypes of the people and the leadership, agility is uh, quite scary, right? So we really need to work on the change of how we lead organization and how we lead people. And uh, the other factor is people because uh, even if you consider, for example, the global business sector in Poland, you've got a quarter of million of extremely well-educated, extremely well-talented people. Having said that, global business services is a sector is quite um, a hierarchy based and we truly need to change that and change the way we lead the sector to be able to adapt to those changes. Otherwise, the changes will change the sector. I dare to disagree a little because uh, <laughs> well culture there. indeed is important. It may be a showstopper, although not such a great one as it uh, used to be in the past. Well, the, all those Xerox examples, and there are plenty more, um, uh, have uh, well injected fear into many mindsets of the, the, the CEOs. So I think the culture is adjusting, but the real problem was in what Phil showed on his slide, the unstructured data. Why are some companies years after uh, running their first bots still at the beginning of the journey? Because their processes are unstructured. The data there is a mess and uh, sometimes they think that throwing a couple of robots on, um, uh, on the process will, will solve the problem, but they haven't done the, um, the groundwork. And in many companies, I dare believing that this is the main showstopper. Yeah. But then from your experience, um, what do you think the true impact will be uh, on jobs in operations and IT as we look at this sort of fervor around automation at this moment? Mm -hmm. A great opportunity, for sure, because um, to what uh, Ms. Ivana just mentioned, uh, we hire a uh, typical skill set of people which we hire uh, across the industry in Poland is uh, we have people with master's uh, degrees processing our invoices. Do we really that? No. Are the, and these are the first jobs which, which should go away and they will be going away. And all those highly skilled people, they'll be the ones taking over the middle office jobs of which we have still a scarcity in Poland. So yes, some jobs will be diminishing, but uh, in our industry, in our country, for sure, over the next couple of years, the middle and highly skilled jobs uh, will for sure um, continue to rise. There will be completely new jobs which we haven't seen before. Uh, and it will be great uh, career paths for the staff which we are employing nowadays. And just to add on that, I think we, if we uh, don't do that, right, if, if we decide to deny, we won't be able to hire. Because if you think about it, uh, all of the uh, candidates that are coming to our businesses are also consumers, and consumer marketplace is definitely developing much faster in the, I mean, we, we all want to have easy click button uh, that you showed before uh, for how we are being hired, how we are processing uh, the candidates. So if we don't, for example, in our space, do that, do the automation and embrace it, we will not be able to hire candidates because they will not want to be hired in that way and also do those manual processes because they will just not be, uh, you know, that they won't be like their lives. So I think that's, that's key as well. Okay. But I actually, yes, I actually think it's a great opportunity for right. the sector. I truly believe it's a huge opportunity because uh, the sector, the global business services sector, has an opportunity to take the lead in the transformation of certain processes, in the transformation of operations. And uh, using, for example, all the automation, all the artificial intelligence tr trends we talk about, and also using data, right? Because I do understand and I fully agree that the data being unstructured, it's an issue. But at the same time, application of artificial intelligence into reading the unstructured data, linking it, linking it with the structured data to the, the amount of data, the volume of data that the, the sector has already is a great opportunity. And also I think that the talent in that sector and also the, the talent in leadership 
who understands the whole business operation set and framework, it's, I think, a great opportunity for, the, for you, for the sector, to take the lead in the transformation of the whole company. Do you think we have a moral obligation to follow here as, as leaders in this industry? Like a set of ethics that we should agree on? It's a great question. This one I love. Uh, right. If we were to go down that path and have a moral obligation, then we may come to a point where we are doing harm to our companies and being counterproductive to what the company uh, actually would like to uh, achieve. So, no, I don't think so, but we should have a moral obligation in order to upskill our staff and to prepare them for the evolution which is coming. And please do not misunderstand the question, these moral obligations with uh, CSR, uh, these are completely two different things. Good, thank you. I think, I think we answered the next one. So I'd like to um, finish up with a great question about what we've learned from today's conversation about um, what's the one thing we can go back and do on Monday um, to impact our companies based on everything we've talked about today. Maybe we can start Kathleen at the end here. So we talked about culture being a one big block of uh, speedy uh, digitization, digital transformation. Um, you have an influence on the culture. So maybe one, one thing that I can recommend from Monday, if you are not already doing this, is to truly be a role model and drive the change in your behaviors, in how you assess risk, how you sign up on projects, how you work, collaborate across your organization, across outside of your immediate group, and then think about being nimble and agile, uh, which you will need for a successful digital transformation at speed. Well. I'm a man of deeds, so I, I'd rather that you get back to your desk, get the things done, implement the robots, get the change rolling, and then let others talk, uh, talk about it. I would say be brave in embracing the change and, and being part of the change, actually. Uh, be inclusive, so bring that organization with you. Um, and also, I think, I think you know, be, be the uh, change maker. So go there, and if something doesn't work, uh, just, just say it out loud, I would say. Finally, yes. one thing on Monday. Yeah, uh, I mean, I'm always telling as well my team, right? Always question the status quo in, in a constructive way, meaning each day think about what you can do better, how you can apply all this concept we were talking about, automation, artificial intelligence, but uh, at the same time in a constructive way, try to embrace it and uh, think about changing the status quo of course, after having your job done. There we go. Well, thank you, everybody. There you go. <laughs>